First of all, thank you very much for the opportunity to present here. I have to apologize that my Russian is so poor that I cannot um, dare to make a presentation in Russian, and I hope it will improve in due time. Now, what might be a reason for me to make a presentation here? What I would like to show is work about Germantics, about a spiritual perception of um, landscape and of cultural and architectonic features that have been created in these two books. There are guides of about 300 pages each on 80 sites of spiritual and energetic power in my region in northern Bavaria, which is a region of about 5 million people and very rich in cultural history um, due to a variety of political factors, many small principalities and art-loving bishops who built here uh, magnificent uh, churches, palaces, and so on. And it is a rich area also in Germanic and spiritual phenomena, like sites of apparitions, like Lourdes. We have some corresponding sites here to uh, Medjugorje or Fatima. To speak about this in our context is a strange asymmetry because Germany has, of course, has its very rich uh, philosophical and artistic tradition of Romanticism. And I was enchanted to find in Russia how much of it is received in your culture of our best traditions of Fichte, Schelling and others. However, in German culture, the, the rule of national socialists have brought about an association between these mystical and esoteric traditions of uh, my country, of Germany, with national socialism. So this kind of, uh, it is perceived as irrational and as fascist at the same time. So writing this book, of which I wrote about a half, um, these two books, we were constantly, as an author's collective, we were constantly confronted time and again with the suspicion of being fascist or being irrationalist. And esotericism is still being denigrated and criticized as allegedly paving the way for fascist irrationalism. So in spite of our Protestant and Catholic heritage that shaped our cultures, up to the 20th century, mid 20th, late 20th century, and still today. Since about 70 years, there is a strong materialist and rationalist force in society that has become dominant. About less than 50% of our population are still members of a church. It is going down. The percentage of self declared atheists is about 25%, but this segment is powerful in government presently, also in society and also in academia. The result is there is no such wonderful symposium as this one, to my knowledge, in Germany. It would be a very daring endeavor to organize a symposium like this in the academic sphere in Germany. So to look to Russia and the Russian speaking sphere, it is like a certain homecoming for mystical and esoteric uh, traditions. And we also have to thank the Orthodox Church and the neo um uh, philosophy, neo neopalamism, for creating a culture in which such things can be reported. But so much for the introduction, and I hope you will find resonances. Now, to move on with the full, yes. Geomanty is a formation that uh, was developed in the late 20th century. It is not geomantics as a divinatory method, as it is also connected to this term, but it is a perception that the land, nature, culture, and religion and history interact, creating energetic phenomena and energetic perceptions at certain places. These may include energies of nature, such as lines of energies, nodes of energies, intersection of energetic lines. 
realms of spirit beings, angels, souls, apparitions, dream apparitions, phenomenological apparitions. Then the psychic, the, the impact of a, a site, of a place, of nature and of architecture, for instance, to the soul. Do special dreams occur in a special place? Do they relate to the individual or collective unconscious, as, for instance, in myths and legends that are told about certain places? Then there is also the idea that places store information and emotional imprints, good or bad, so that a dynamic synthesis of natural and spiritual, cultural, psychic, and historic features happens. So the concept of sites of power, sites of special energy, is dynamic, and it is um, it affects uh, persons, and persons affect affect these sites too. So they are charged and loaded, and there is a dynamic interplay. Then the idea of genius loki, a spirit of a place, which develops in interaction with the history of a site. Then also a dynamic, therefore a dynamic view of reality emerges, in which subjective and objective factors, the material and the immaterial, interact in an environment of which we are part. According to Guillemanti, these sites influence people individually and collectively, and they influence such sites too. Now, the establishment of Guillemanti, the book that I'm presenting, uh, I'm added a photo of it, Olivia Klein, Knecht, Gedächtnis von Gegenständen oder die Macht der Dinge, is a 765 pages tom in a good uh, scientific publisher. Um, she assembled approaches from natural sciences, uh, from cultural history, religious history, and so on. Um, it is a book that has the documents, part of the research, and but there are other uh, books in academia proper too uh, that cover these is uh, issues, like by Kozlyanich and others. Now, from 1970 on, Guillemanti became established in culture and society in German-speaking countries, also beyond First, individual architects, landscape architects, and other professionals lectured and published on these issues to establish sites of power as an aesthetic and a perceptual category. This brought uh, the topic and the approach to the awareness of the readership, and part of it has also been received in academia very, very carefully. Then, professional schools for Germantics became established, as in 1994 by Marko Pogacnik, a uh, Slovenian, uh, Stefan Brönli, and others. Axis Mundi, these are, uh, they offer courses of uh, training for professionals uh, part-time or on weekend courses over years to sensitize them uh, to phenomena of sites of power and also how to work with them in, in architecture and in cultural history and so on. And an umbrella society was founded, the Europäische Dachverband für ganzheitliche Raumkultur. These schools are active with websites on the internet and also in publications. Now, the idea of energies that you are uh, certainly familiar with, lie energies, um, given an interesting um, grid over the country, but one can observe that these lines of power go th and their nodes go through the most ancient and historically important cities like Aachen, where the Franconian Empire was founded, here is at the node of many, many sites. Regensburg, Nuremberg, where I'm living. Then here, the realm of Karlsruhe, Basel, and others. And one can, even on a more uh, micro level, one can see that these uh, lines um, connect important places. We can see one line connects Aachen, Frankfurt, Aschaffenburg, Würzburg, Nürnberg, where I live, Regensburg, Passau, up to Vienna, and others are there too. So we can observe a certain, if these uh, assumptions of these lines and the perceptions about them hold, we can see how history, cultural history, religious history too, political history, and such phenomena of the energetic phenomena of the land, how they interact. In, um, in my city of Nürnberg, one can observe the same. There are certain lines, energetic lines, ley lines, but also it is a bit more speculative, uh, lines of, in, of angelic manifestation, whatever that may be, but uh, they have been perceived unanimously. They um, 
describe the node of the city of Nuremberg on the fortress where the city was founded by an imperial fortress and also the major churches um, are situated on these lines such Zabaldus, the imperial church with the relics of the patron saint who was a hesychast of the 12th century, uh, St. Lorenz, the citizen cathedral, St. Jacob, the Teutonic Knights, and others. Now, um, this has first been dismissed as fantasy, but uh, the custodians of, uh, of historic monuments have discovered features that do correspond to such uh, lines. Here we have images of St. Sebald's Kirche. On the northern side of the church, where a line, energetic line comes from the castle above the city. It enters uh, the church in front here in the front line, um, goes about to this side where the flowers are in front of the tomb of St. Sebald, the hermit and patron saint of the city. But on the outside, uh, the stone has been excavated, like by spoons or in such movements, and this has often been thought these must be damages due to wars or whatever, but it has been recognized that these are sites of energetic lines. So in former times, people scraped out the stone as a nourishment to, for healing. And this phenomenon has, is a systematic phenomenon also observed in other uh, Gothic uh, churches in Franconia. So these stones have been preserved in the outer wall and not uh, removed and renewed again. So this historical indirect evidence gives a certain validity to the claim that energetic phenomena did indeed have a great role in the location of ancient uh, Gothic churches. And as you can see here to the right, the uh, St. Sebald's Kirche does not have a straight axis, but it is slightly uh, banana shaped, slightly curvilinear. You can see it here, the curvilinear axis of St. Sebald. And uh, there is one energetic line claimed to run along this curvilinear main axis, but also the other one entering from the south, from the north, uh, at the intersection here at St. Sebald's grave. Now this uh, shrine of St. Sebald has been moved about two, two meters. It should be here, actually. It has been shifted a bit, um, but this is how things go. Now, Guillemanti has attained a certain uh, acceptance in society. Uh, this is um, a granite stele that has been placed on a certain uh, point of a ley line in the city of Nürnberg. Hunter cooperated with uh, the garden department of the city of Nuremberg to be permitted to place such a stele on a certain site. So you can see how such a garden department of the city, municipal department, is has proved to be open to Germanic ideas to give permission and also financial and logistic support for such a stele with a symbolic uh, inscription on top here to fortify and to purify certain features of the landscape and to have such a stele placed in public in a public park. I observed this in other places too, like Bad Kissingen or in Schweinfurt where I worked. Similar installations have been made in response to Germanic ideas. And this may show you a bit of the societal acceptance that Germanic ideas have received in the past um, 20 years or so. Now, let us take a look at the perspective of religious history. There is one very important uh, story told in the Old Testament that has been re-edited by the collective of uh, priests in the Babylonian exile, which is about 550 before Christ. These collective editors, the priests' uh, colleg collegium and the scholarly collegium of Jewish re religion, they re-edited uh, all of the history of uh, from the beginnings of Israel through the Mosaic times up to the time of the Babylonian exile. And they retold and therefore also authorized the story of uh, Jacob's vision of the ladder. And this is very important because the implicit concept that certain sites are sites of power and special sites for 
revelation, not only for Jewish revelation, but also for pre-Jewish Canaanite revelation. This idea has been endorsed by this same priestly collegium that also authored the Jewish laws, uh, the beginnings of uh, the Talmud, and so on. The story is uh, familiar in Orthodoxy and one of the Church story of orthodoxy. It is told that when Jacob was uh, had to flee from because he cheated on his brother, uh, he slept at a certain site, a ruined site, and uh, in, sleeping there on this old Canaanite temple site, he had a dream uh, that of a ladder coming from heaven down to him, to and angels coming up and down. Saint John Climacus, Saint John of the Ladder. Uh, called himself, named was called after this dream. And the text is, uh, when Jacob aw awakes in the morning, he said, surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. And he was afraid. How awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God, the Canaanite site. This is the gate of heaven. And early the next morning, Jacob took the stone he had placed under his head, set it up as a pillar, poured ore on top of it, and he called the place Bethel, though the city used to be called Lutz. And here, this has collected, uh, entered collective memory, cultural memory in the West too. Uh, a, a painting by Michael Lukas Willmann, 1691. So this is not only preserved in Orthodox cultural memory, but also in that of Protestant of the Protestant and Catholic realm. So this is a evidence and a archetypal story of a site of power across the sequence of religion from pagan Canaanite times into Judaism. Um, as being a gate of heaven. So um, we can find a similar idea in the Kievan Paterikon. There are two stories about it that are similar in character. When Abbot Sofroni was on his way home at night, he saw, quote, he saw a light only over the monastery of the Blessed Fyodosi. And a few chapters later, a man riding at night saw the venerable Fyodosi standing in this light in his monastery, praying. And a great fl flame emerged from the cupola of the church and extended in an arc to a site on a hill that the saint had designated for a new church. So, Fyodosi was praying and he had in his mind that somehow seen and perceived a site for a new church and apparently his intention, whatever he received and may have desired and prayed for it, to build a church there was perceived in a special form of perception of Eisthesis by this man riding at night or whatever who saw this arc of light moving to the new side of the chapel. So uh, this shows to which extent such phenomena are enrooted in Orthodox tradition and probably culture too and there are certain affinities not as strong, however, in the Roman Catholic uh, tradition of Franconia or of Germany where I live. However, these things are being revived in, uh, in popular culture and also in the spiritual and esoteric culture that makes up about 25% of the German population who share uh, such ideas. So recently, a real estate agent told me that she immediately feels the atmosphere of a house that she buys or sells even when it is empty. So the idea of a spirit of the place, be it light or be it burdened, be it negative, is shared widely in culture, um, even beyond what is official culture, which is very materialistic in Germany. One of the academic sources here is uh, Robert Josef Kozeljanic, Der Geist eines Ortes, Kulturgeschichte und Phänomenologie des Genius Loki, two volumes, it's an academic uh, work. The Spirit of a Place, the Cultural History and Phenomenology of the Genius Look of the Spirit of a Place. So indirectly, such as by Kozlianich, such ideas are entering academic discourse, however distant. Now this has a certain has certain repercussions uh, for the practice of the conservation and also of the perception of architectonic sites. Here we have the most eminent cathedral of late Gothic in Germany, St. Lorenzkirche, because uh, Nuremberg was a free city and a very wealthy, self-governing city-state, probably like Novgorod a bit earlier. Uh, and the city built this wonderful cathedral, which has a mystagogic program, 
of the church as the renewed paradise when it enters, uh, passes by Adam and Eve. And in the front of the church, there is a wonderful carving of the messenger angel uh, who comes to visit the Virgin Mary uh, to announce uh, that you will conceive the Son of God. This whole program of this cathedral is one mystagogic program. Now, three years ago, uh, the, the head pastor of this uh, congregation, Lutheran congregation, and the um, parish council, whose members are some of the most eminent families of uh, an ancient family of the city, they decided to secularize the, the first quarter of this cathedral to install storage room for chairs, shops, uh, technical rooms, assembly rooms, and everything the like. So that only after passing through a, a quarter of this cathedral would one have entered the sacred place proper. This is a uh, severe protest, but it has been uh, accepted by the church leadership and they would have supported it with uh, four and a half million euro. Uh, so this was actually decided, and the official um, propaganda about it was uh, one should lower the threshold for secular people so they don't feel strange when they come into a church, which means in practice that it should feel like a shopping mall or a social convention center. And it was argued, well, for services, one doesn't need the whole church. It's enough to have a space in front in the intersection, in the choir. There one can pray, but the rest should be utilized for a more social purposes. So you can perceive the deep secularization that is going on, actually, a parish council and the priests should be the custodians and understand the symbolic meaning, which is also energetic factors, should understand this and be the guardians of such a sacred and energetic work of architecture. And they did exactly the opposite. So the strange thing that happened between in 2000, end of 2021, 2022, and into 2023 was that uh, we had to make a campaign, which was fortunately taken up by the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung, to remind about the sacred program, the mystagogic program of this church, which is, of course, a Catholic program, not a Lutheran one, and this is now a Lutheran church, and uh, to raise public protest to a degree that the church had to revoke these ideas of secularizing its own work of art. Now, the energetic factor, factor about this church is that a ley line passes through these two towers in the West Front. And these two towers are the places when most visitors come to pray. This is indirect support. Here we have a, a place for prayer with candles and tens of thousands of people come every year to pray here. Well, this space would have been... We must finish, really. Okay, I will conclude soon. This space would have been transformed to an office building. That's all? And 100,000 visitors come here. You can see the insane degree of secularization that is going on in the Lutheran Church to uh, propose such an idea. This is how the uh, architecture would have looked like. This is a very moderate place. The side alleys would have been built up with office buildings. The entrance around the narthex too, and only a more limited space would have been here. Now, Umberto Eco stated, where the semiotics of architecture as of building are no longer understood, the destruction or transformation follows. So we have, here we have the cultural situation that uh, eminent people in arts protest. The major newspaper, Frankfurt Allgemeine Zeitung, which is uh, the flagship of a uh, trusteeship of uh, our historic monuments and uh, cultural history, they raised the campaign, and I was a uh, participant in this, to protect this church from this uh, destructive secularization and vandalization that would have been happened. Now, in this uh, campaign, arguments about energetic factors have played a certain role. And uh, we could see that very gradually, such ideas of germantics, of uh, energetic and perceptual isthesis, uh, begin to play a role, that certain sites, in the, like in these chapels, are to be recognized as relevant. And I could see in France, by the way, that the arson of the Notre Dame uh, of Paris and also of Nantes have created a revival in France, in very secular France, to see that these 
cathedrals indeed incorporate different views of reality, energetic, mystagogic, and others. And there is a huge public effort and much funding by the government of France to restore these cathedrals and it has been awakened. And in a post-secular way, the discourse in France has arisen. We should take the mystagogic and the spiritual heritage seriously because it is the core of our culture. I have to say, in Germany, our discourse is not that far because of the association of mysticism with fascism, which makes such discourse very difficult. But we can, I hope to have showed you that different views, energetic as of the Middle Ages, early modern ages, are beginning to re receive a certain respect in general culture, even in secular culture, and non whereas the Protestant church is in the process of ongoing secularization, the Catholic church is less affected. This is a very strange turning of tables that the historical and also esoteric and mystic uh, heritage has in, built in such churches as being taken seriously and being accepted by society as a large bicultured uh, segments of society. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, also for the patients with such very different strands that have been going on, but I hope to have uh, indicated a bit about the web of discourses, web of meanings that is being uh, connected to the issue of sites of power, to Germantics, and also to the discourses and the practical actions in the conservation of uh, monuments and sites that do indeed have a certain uh, energetic factors. And I can say about these books that are being read by the readers of a very different orientation, interested in religious history, in energetic sites, in the cultural history, the legends, the myths, and the practice that are connected to such sites. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you very much, Ulrich. Uh, we have uh, time only for one uh, short question. Uh, only one question, Ruslan. Speech. It was very interesting uh, uh, things that you have said about your uh, geometrics project have reminded me of some uh, other attempts of other authors to explain this uh, genius Loki phenomena, uh, such as uh, psychogeography movement established by Lita Bo and situationist, and later, um, uh, which was later evolved by some other authors in more spiritual way, like. You know, Alan Moore, uh, and so on, uh, which reminded me of uh, works of Gaston Bachelard about uh, poetic, of dream, um, poetic of spaces and dream spaces, and even a like, project uh, of uh, mythological geography of Russian traditionalist philosopher Eugene Glavin. Uh, so I would like to ask, uh, do some of these authors, authors have some influence on this uh, geomantics project? that you have uh, presented here. Um, the question is about uh, the philosophical authors, maybe, that are connected to this. Um, in the written version, I will um, give more inf um, information about Kozelianich and uh, Kleinknecht, who have documented these things. But, um, what I'm personally also interested in is, are there comparable uh, discourses and the practices in the Russian cultural sphere of uh, perceiving sacred sites, maybe even special monasteries or so, also from a mystical and esoteric perspective. Because this discourse was rooted in Roman Catholic mysticism of the late medieval ages into early modern times up to Romanticism. But since it has moved out of the church field and it has become a distinct discourse, in the esotericism of the early 20th century and then from the late 20th century on into the present. This has become divorced from uh, Protestantism anyway, which is deeply secularizing and secularized, unfortunately, and a bit less to, uh, in the Roman Catholic sphere. And as I perceive it, in the Orthodox sphere, these things are connected. For, in this book, I also included the chapter on the Orthodox Romanian Orthodox monastery of Nuremberg, uh, which has certain energetic fe features, but I assume that the discourse formation is different in Russia, with energetic phenomena and perceptions and ideas and concepts probably being more part of the general orthodox and neopolemic culture 
than it is in Germany, where it is very much opposite. We found Lutheranism with materialism on one side and esotericism and mystical perceptions on the other side. I hope I got your idea and picked up the cue. Thanks. Thanks, Lurich. Uh, and uh, uh, we must finish uh, this. Uh, yes, please. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh,